Good afternoon and welcome to the National Capital Planning Commission's June 1st, 2023 open session. Um, I note that there is a, uh, or can I, can we please have the roll call taken, Ms. Coster? You, of course. Uh, Commissioner Cozart? Here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McMahon? I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Stidham? I'm here. Thank you. Commissioner Argo? Here. Thank you. Vice Chair Hewlett? Present. Thank you. Chair Goodman? Present. Uh, Commissioner Green? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Wright? Here. Thank you. Commissioner Dixon? Here. Thank you. Uh, and Commissioners Cash and Davis have informed me they will not be attending. I'll note that Marcella Costa, the Executive Director, Ann Schuyler, the General Counsel, and Diane Sullivan with the Urban Design and Plan Review Division are also in the meeting. Thank you, Ms. Coster. Noting the presence of the quorum, I'd like to call the meeting to order. Today's meeting is live streamed and will be available in a few days uh, as a video on NCPC's website. And if there's no objection, the agenda as posted is adopted as the order of business. Um, can we now play a, a short video clip with the Pledge of Allegiance and join along? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. NCPC will continue to conduct our businesses online until the renovations of the commission chambers are complete. I want to share how we will conduct commission business. Following staff presentations and any other testimony, I will ask for a motion and a second as appropriate. During the commission deliberations, I will use the round robin format to ask each commissioner if they have any comments. As a reminder, during deliberations, all commissioners should be on video during that time, unless you're experiencing technical difficulties. At other times, commissioners may ask to be recognized. The next uh, item on the agenda, I would like to ask, um, uh, item two, I should say, on the agenda in the report that is the report of the chair but I do want to take this moment and welcome Tammy Stidham, who is Acting Associate Regional Director with the National Park Service, who's gonna be representing the Secretary of Interior. So welcome, uh, Commissioner Stidham, to this uh, commission, your first commission meeting, and we look forward to working with you. Um, agenda item number three is the report of the Executive Director, Mr. Uh, Acosta, please. Thank you, Chair Goodman, and good afternoon. The public comment period for the draft monumental course small scale streetscape elements closes on June 20th. The public is invited to submit comments via NCPC's website. We also welcome Anna Amosa, who joined NCPC's physical planning division as a summer intern. Anna supports our work on Independence Avenue, Pennsylvania Avenue, and other agency initiatives. She just finished her junior year at George Washington University and is working towards a dual degree in geography and political science with a minor in geographic information systems. Welcome, Anna, and turn your camera on and just say hello so people can find you in the matrix. Hi. Welcome aboard. Uh, that concludes my uh, report. You do have a written report in your package, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Acosta, and welcome, uh, Ms. Armosa. And um, I, we're just happy to have you as part of our team, and I'm sure the staff will appreciate all your talent uh, as, as you become our intern. Does the commission have any questions for the executive director? Hearing none, um, we'll move on to agenda item number four, and that is the legislative update from Ms. Schuyler. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Goodman. Um, I do not have anything to report. Right. Well, agenda item number five is a consent calendar. There are four items on this month's consent calendar. These include the Children's Inn renovations at NIH, the FDA White Oak Truck Screening Facility, the Army Family Housing Renovation Program at Fort Myer, and the main side parking improvements at Marine Base Quantico. Are there any questions or discussion on the consent calendar? So, so move. Second. 
thank you. It's been moved and seconded that we um, approve uh, this month's consent calendar. Uh, are there any questions? Hearing none, Ms. Coster, will you confirm the motion, the second, and take the vote uh, by roll call, please? Yes, the motion was made uh, to approve the consent calendar by Commissioner Dixon. It was seconded by Vice Chair Hewlett. And with that, uh, Commissioner Cozart? Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Stidham? Yes. Commissioner Argo? Yes. Vice Chair Hewlett? <laughs> yes. Uh, Chair Goodman? Yes. Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, the motion has carried. And thank you, Ms. Coster, for, for that. Sure. Uh, moving on to agenda item number six, uh, we have a request to approve the preliminary site design development plans for the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park seawall rehabilitation. Uh, Mr. Webb? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Are you able to see my screen? Yes, I am. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. So good afternoon, excuse me, good afternoon, Chair Goodman and members of the commission. The National Park Service has submitted preliminary site development plans for the rehabilitation of approximately 6,800 linear feet of the failing seawall along portions of the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park in Washington, DC. NPS only has funding for rehabilitation and repair at this time and is therefore taking a phased approach of first stabilizing sections of the wall and restoring the historic functional height, allowing more time to consider additional measures in the future. NPS will be working with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and other stakeholders on future planning efforts to consider broader climate change impacts and solutions in a comprehensive plan for the Tidal Basin and for West and East Potomac Parks. The Commission provided comments on the applicant's concept design back on January 5th, earlier this year, supporting the project's goals, including returning the seawalls to their historic functional height, improving visitor accessibility and experience over the next decade, and planning for sea level rise in the future. Since the concept review, MPS has completed both the Section 106 process under the National Historic Preservation Act which resulted in an executed memorandum of agreement. Also, for their National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA compliance, NPS has signed a finding of no significant impact based on the environmental assessment that was released earlier this spring. The EA process was specific to this project, the rehabilitation of select portions of the seawalls of the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park. NPS will return to the Commission for a final review in the upcoming months. The seawall area along the Potomac River and Tidal Basin were created as part of a land reclamation project beginning in the mid-19th century. West Potomac Park is a U.S. National Park in Washington, D.C., adjacent to the National Mall. It includes park, the parkland that extends south of the Lincoln Memorial Reflecting Pool and from the Lincoln Memorial to the grounds of the Washington Monument. The park is the site of many national landmarks, including the Korean War Veterans Memorial, the Jefferson Memorial, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial, and the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial that you can see here on this map. West Potomac Park, as well as East Potomac Park, and the area encompassing the Tidal Basin were listed in the National Register of Historic Places in 1973. The seawalls are considered contributing features to the National Register of Historic Districts. At preliminary review, the Commission evaluates the applicant's approach to the proposed site improvements, landscape design, any impacts to key views, and how the project has responded to previous Commission comments. In this case, the applicant has provided additional information on tree removal and replacement as requested by the Commission in January. The design approach for the rehabilitation of the seawalls 
remains consistent with what was submitted for concept review. As I mentioned, the applicant will return for a final review by the commission in the future. Now, as a reminder from what we saw back in January, I will share some images of the existing conditions resulting from the issues with the seawalls, as well as provide an orientation to the project area. As these existing photographs show, over the years, the seawalls have significantly settled, leading to water overtopping the seawalls, as well as poor drainage. This has led to reduced public access and damage to the cultural landscape and park infrastructure, resulting in negative impacts to visitor use and experience. This slide shows the extent of the current project area, which is outlined in yellow, of the 6,800 linear feet. This project will address immediate issues of the failing seawall in locations demonstrating the highest degree of settlement and erosion. The applicant has indicated the project will not address longer term rises in sea level at this time, but the structural approach could allow for additional wall height in the future. NPS will conduct a comprehensive analysis for all of the tidal basin seawalls to determine if additional wall increases or other approaches are suitable and appropriate. The portion of the tidal basin that is within this project is approximately 2,000 linear feet, or 19% of the full tidal basin at 10,450 linear feet. In this area, the seawalls have the highest degree of settlement and erosion. The remaining 4,800 linear feet of the project comprises the West Potomac Park seawalls. The project area is divided into four distinct sections, beginning with Tidal Basin East that extends from the Inlet Bridge to the Jefferson Memorial Steps. You can see this area circled in yellow on the left image of the slide. Its current configuration dates to the early 1940s as a portion of the Tidal Basin itself was adjusted to make room for the construction of the Jefferson Memorial. The seawall features a concrete wall with historic stones along its outward face. The wall closest to the inlet bridge date back to approximately 1909 when the inlet bridge was built. Land settlement in this area has caused daily flooding with water unable to naturally drain, becoming trapped on the land, leading to vegetation die off and damage to tree health. The next area is Tidal Basin West, which extends from the inlet bridge to the pathway to the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial next to the Japanese Pagoda. This section of wall was first built in the late 1800s. The Tidal Basin West wall was reconstructed between 1907 and 1909 when the inlet bridge was constructed by the Corps of Engineers. In 1941, an eight inch thick concrete coping was added to the top to heighten the wall to account for settlement. Today, the walls show evidence of settlement behind the walkway, resulting in water ponding and vegetation damage along the inside edge of the walkway. The next project area is West Potomac Park South, which extends from the inlet bridge to approximately the intersection of West Basin Drive and Ohio Drive. The West Potomac Park South seawall is the oldest in the project area. The foundation was completed in 1884 and the top of the seawall completed in 1891. However, riprap and other fill like concrete and asphalt have been periodically added to stabilize the wall or shoreline through the 1990s. The last project area is West Potomac Park North, which extends from the intersection of West Basin Drive and Ohio Drive to the Memorial Bridge. This is the newest section of the seawall, which dates to 1957. Pepco rebuilt this section of the wall with a concrete cap. Excavation of the soil behind the wall in this area indicates it is a cast in place concrete wall with a stone veneer. It is unknown if any of the original seawall, uh, excuse me, any of the original seawall stones remain. As described at concept and carried forward for this preliminary review, the design's approach will allow for additional height to be added to the seawalls in the future as sea level increases, if determined viable following comprehensive analysis. This project will increase the percentage of total park area that is open and safely accessible for public visitation by reducing instances of flooding, overtopping, and pooling of water. 
In addition, a significant amount of deferred maintenance backlog will be addressed by the project. After careful consideration to address the immediate issues with the stabilization of the seawalls in the project area, the Park Service determined that the design should incorporate a pile supported foundation extending to the bedrock to avoid future settlement. This solution also allows the wall heights to be raised in the future. However, as I mentioned previously, additional comprehensive study will be necessary to consider whether this or other approaches will appropriately address sea level rise. Therefore, staff supports the applicant project goals to rehabilitate the tidal basin and West Potomac Park seawalls to return the seawalls to their historic functional height, improve visitor accessibility and experience, and plan for future, future sea level rise. In addition, staff finds that the seawall rehabilitation project must balance historic preservation considerations, visitor experience, and program needs. As this is a rehabilitation project, the goal is to reestablish the seawall's historic functional height and reconstruct it along the historic alignment. When first constructed and adhered to in subsequent modifications and extensions, the seawall was built to an elevation of six feet above mean low water. Settlement combined with rising sea levels have resulted in the wall residing much closer to the water surface. And when we say historic functional height, this means the relationship between the water level, the height of the seawall, and the landscaping adjacent to the wall. To correct this, the selected top of wall elevation is based on a height of six feet above current mean low water. The proposed height will help keep adjacent areas from flooding during normal tidal events, as well as minor flood stage events. This results in an elevation increase of 4.74, excuse me, 4.75 feet within the tidal basin. The applicant has indicated the project will not cause new overtopping in other areas of the tidal basin outside the current project area once the seawalls are reconstructed to their historic functional height. Where the re rehabilitated walls meet existing walls, which are not included in the project, the difference in heights are minimal. The sidewalk transition will be accommodated through a slight slope. The top of wall elevation along West Potomac Park will be increased by 5.5 feet. This is to account for the additional impact and overtopping of larger waves, which do not impact the walls inside the tidal basin. The Potomac River and the tidal basin are part of a joint open system because there are currently no effective flood controls separating the two water bodies. Therefore, the height of the water within the Potomac River matches very closely the height of the water within the tidal basin. Consistent with the concept design, the preliminary design includes foundations that bear on bedrock, relieving the weight of the structure on the soils that caused previous settlement. This type of foundation could allow for future capacity for the walls to be raised vertically in response to future sea level rise and increasing storm surge elevations. Two of the main requirements of this project are to prevent future settlement of the seawall and maintain the historic character. The proposed pile supported foundation details reflect what NPS believes to provide ease of construction and reduced cost while preventing future settlement. Staff notes that implementation of any of the alternatives developed in the comprehensive plan, including any additional height to the seawall, will need to be approved by NCPC. To the best extent possible, the stones of the historic wall will be salvaged and reused in the rehabilitation. The proposed face of the wall maximizes the reuse of historic stone, maintains the historic ashlar stone look, and has the ability to be built upon to combat future projected higher water levels if needed. The preferred approach includes maximizing reuse of historic stones, utilizes an even coarsen and stone size with rough and smooth faces, and a uniform stone color with medium gaps. Since the concept review, as requested by the commission, the applicant has provided information on the tree removal and replacement. 
238 trees will be removed in the project area with 314 trees to be replanted, consisting of the Japanese cherry, evergreen, and deciduous trees. Trees removed will be replaced in kind or a more acceptable or suitable species for the location and soil conditions and the park as determined appropriate by an interdisciplinary team led by a historical landscape architect at a ratio meeting NCPC's tree policy. As such, staff finds that the project includes planting more resilient vegetation in identified areas informed by the Tidal Basin Cultural Landscape Report with tree removal and replacement that meets NCPC's comprehensive plan policies. In regards to other components of the landscape adjacent to the seawalls, walkways will be repaired or replaced to reestablish the character of the park and the visitor's experience. Pathways will be widened to 12 feet to accommodate the park visitors. The seawall rehabilitation project will also correct deficiencies in the upland areas behind the walls Grading will be adjusted to accommodate the elevated seawall height and to reestablish sheet flow runoff. This will eliminate any existing areas of settlement. The additional elevation and regrading will eliminate the daily inundation of the tides, reduce the impact of, and provide positive drainage of more extreme storms, allowing for cultural landscapes of the park to be restored. As I mentioned earlier in the presentation, as part of the executed memorandum of agreement for the Section 106 compliance, NPC, NPS, excuse me, NPS will complete a comprehensive plan for the Tidal Basin. The plan will include alternatives to rehabilitate the Tidal Basin landscape, address sea level rise, and protect as well as enhance aquatic environments while accommodating high levels of visitors. Staff also request that for the final project review, NPS provide a time frame for the Tidal Basin comprehensive plan. NPS considers both the Martin Luther King Jr. and the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorials contributing resources to the Tidal Basin area and the related historic districts. Staff notes NPS will seek funding to complete cultural landscape reports for both the memorials in the next few years. Cultural landscape reports are guides to the treatment and use of a cultural landscape. A cultural landscape report includes an inventory of the elements comprising the landscape and an evaluation and analysis of existing conditions. Staff requests that for the final project review, NPS provide a time frame and commitment for completing this cultural landscape reports for both the memorials. In addition, staff requests that the applicant provide more information for the next review on how the future Tidal Basin Comprehensive Plan alternatives will address these two memorials. To conclude, staff recognizes that NPS's focus for this project is rehabilitating the seawalls to their historic functional height in the areas that have the most significant erosion and settlement resulting in daily overtopping of the wall. This, dis this impacts and diminishes the visitor experience and access in the Tidal Basin area and leads to further degradation of the landscape. This project is not intended to address the larger issues of flooding and sea level rise. As I've noted in the presentation, NPS will be starting soon a comprehensive plan for the Tidal Basin. Staff looks forward to continuing to work with the Park Service, partner federal agencies, the Memorial Foundations, and other consulting parties as they commence work on the comprehensive plan for the Tidal Basin to consider broader climate change impacts and solutions. Thus, it is the executive director's recommendation that the commission approves the preliminary site development plans for the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park seawalls rehabilitation. While I covered them in the presentation, I would like to reiterate the remaining recommendations, including supports the National Park Service's project goals to rehabilitate the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park seawalls to return the seawalls to their historic functional height, improve the visitor accessibility and experience, and plan for future sea level rise. Finds that the seawall sea wall rehabilitation project must balance historic preservation considerations, visitor experience, and program needs finds that the project includes planting more resilient vegetation 
in identified areas informed by the Tidal Basin Cultural Landscape Report with tree removal and replacement that meets NCPC's comprehensive plan policies. Notes as part of the Section 106 Memorandum of Agreement, MPS will complete a comprehensive plan for the Tidal Basin that will include alternatives to rehabilitate the cultural landscape, address sea level rise, and protect as well as enhance aquatic environments while accommodating high levels of visitors. In addition, notes the implementation of any of the alternatives, including additional height to the seawalls, will need to be approved by NCPC. Notes the NPS will complete cultural landscape reports for both Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial and the Franklin Delano Roosevelt Memorial. MP, as I mentioned, NPS already considers both of these memorials contributing resources to the Tidal Area. And request for the final review that NPS provide a time frame for the Tidal Basin Comprehensive Plan, a time frame and commitment for completing the cultural landscape reports for both memorials, more information of how the Comprehensive Plan alternatives will address the two memorials, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Martin Luther King, and finally, request that the applicant continue to coordinate with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, partner federal agencies, the FDR Memorial Foundation, and other consulting parties as they commence work on the comprehensive plan for the Tidal Basin. And finally, I noted that a memorandum of agreement was prepared and executed on May 19, 2023, pursuant to Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act. The memorandum of agreement signatories included NPS, the District of Columbia State Historic Preservation Office, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and NCPC. The agreement includes a number of minimization and mitigation measures to address adverse effects, including following the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation, the reuse of historic stones, and the installation of interpretive signage. At this time, I would like to introduce Jeff Reinbold, the superintendent of the National Mall and Memorial Parks, Ben Fedor with the Army Corps of Engineers, and Margaret Boshek with the project engineering team, who would like to provide some comments and also help answer any questions the commission may have. Thank you. Great, thanks, Mr. Webb, for that presentation. Um, Thank you all. Uh, your comments in January were incredibly helpful and appreciate the opportunity to meet with you today on what is probably the park's highest uh, priority project. Um, as we get ready for the 250th celebration in 2026, we have a number of major investments underway. Um, it is not a stretch though to say that this is our top priority. Um, we were incredibly fortunate. It was also one of the National Park Service's top priorities for Great American Outdoors Act funding. Um, that's a once in a generation opportunity for us. So to be able to not only address the rehabilitation of the seawalls, but be able to be able to do it in a more comprehensive way um, is incredibly important to us and an opportunity we just haven't had in the past, even though this project has been talked about for decades, probably. Um, I do also want to acknowledge all of the agencies and groups who participated in this. Park Service has a delicate mission here, a balance of protection and preservation with a need to also address change. And this is a good example of where we've worked together to find a way to rebuild seawalls that have been in place for a hundred years, um, but yet do it in a modern way that still maintains the original look and function uh, and original location of those seawalls. Uh, I'm not gonna repeat what, what Mr. Webb said here, but I, I would say that um, I do wanna emphasize that we're prioritizing the rehabilitation of those sections that are most heavily used, that are in the most need of repair, and the areas where the, the seawall gets, uh, gets topped uh, most frequently, right? Twice a day through the, through the tidal rises. Um, the settlement, the seawalls have settled over time. Uh, the deterioration has really led to reduced public access, uh, trip and fall hazards. Uh, some of the photos that we saw there you know, really present an accurate picture of how the cultural landscape and the park infrastructure has been impacted. It also creates an unattractive and inappropriate setting for some of the, for a visit to the Tidal Basin, right? And a visit to the, to the memorials that are adjacent to it. So we are incredibly eager to get this project moving to address the public safety, to address the, the natural and cultural resources, um, and also the, the experience that visitors have, whether it's in West Potomac Park, 
or along the uh, or along the seawalls. Um, the the overtopping has also created structural deficiencies in the seawalls, and uh, you'll see in many of our other seawall systems we've had to close areas. That's not been the case here so far, but we're hoping to remedy that. Um, we're really excited about this approach, uh, this idea of being able to go down to bedrock so that we can not only restore that, that functional height again, uh, but more importantly, give ourselves an opportunity should we need to raise the, the uh, level of that for future climate change, we at least have that ability. It's something we don't have the ability to do right now. And so from a park standpoint, being forward thinking, looking out at what we might be able to do should um, those kinds of measures be needed, uh, at least we have that opportunity. I do want to stress one point too that Mr. Webb made. Uh, this project is not intended to address regional flooding. So this is, this is really those areas that are flooding twice daily because of tides. Um, it will have the benefit that if that area, when that area does flood with larger flood events, that it will be able to drain more efficiently and, and protect the resources behind it. But I, I just want to stress that point that this really is about the twice daily nuisance flooding that, that occurs. Um, I do want to touch on the public engagement that's happened as part of this process, just because it, it's been extensive and a lot of people have rallied uh, to bring the kind of best minds at these at these challenges. Uh, we initiated the project on July 19th of 2022 with a virtual public scoping meeting. And then we had a 55 day public comment period that ended on September 12th of 2022. Um, throughout the project, we've coordinated with the Army Corps, with the OEE, uh, with Fish and Wildlife Service, describing the project, working through potential impacts to sensitive species and wetlands. Uh, we've coordinated with other projects that are occurring in the area. So that includes the DC uh, Water Potomac Tunnel Project, Long Bridge. Um, we initiated Section 106 consultation with the District of Columbia State Historic or Historic Preservation Office, the Virginia Department of Historic Resources, uh, with National Capital Planning Commission, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation on May 19th of 2022. We did hold uh, two Section 106 consulting party meetings. First one was on August 2nd of 2022, and the second one on December 15th of 2022. And the, the purpose of those was to discuss the potential impacts on cultural resources and review the draft assessment of effect um, and draft memorandum of agreement, which outlines all minimization and mitigation efforts uh, of the adverse effects to historic resources. Um, based on the assessment of effects, it was determined that the proposed undertaking will minimize existing and continual adverse effects to historic resources resulting from the failing seawalls, including the, present, the prevention of the daily flooding, erosion of the landscape, and continued loss of Japanese cherry trees and other vegetation. And through the seawall rehabilitation, uh, it will result in adverse effects due to the rebuilding of the seawalls, but there will, be a, there will also be a significant adverse effect to the historic resources by not proceeding with the rehabilitation. Um, Park Service will implement the mitigation measures to avoid, minimize, and mitigate the adverse effects that are described in the Appendix A of that document. Um, the DC SHPO, NCPC, uh, Virginia Department of Historic Resources concurred with that determination in responses um, dated April 21st of 2023 and um, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation on May 19th of 2023. No other adverse effects to, to historic properties were identified in the assessment of effect. Uh, the NPS documented the adverse effects and mitigation as well as the process for further design review in an MOA that we executed on May 19th of 2023. So I do wanna recognize that during the Section 106 process, there were requests for the preparation of the cultural landscape reports for the FDR Memorial and the MLK Memorial. Uh, as Mr. Webb mentioned, we do recognize these are important baseline documents that need to be prepared. Um, they were not needed to make the decisions in this project um, as they, the project does not directly affect these two memorials, but we are committed to the preparation of those documents. Uh, the Martin Luther King Jr. CLR is funded for uh, fiscal year 24, and right now we're in the process of seeking funding for the cultural landscape uh, report for the FDR memorial. 
we did make the EA available for a 30 day public review period from March 6th, 2023 to April 5th of 2023. Uh, the majority of the correspondence has expressed positive support for the project. Response, responses to substantive comments uh, are attached to the FONSI. The EA analyzed a no action and uh, an alternative that will rehabilitate approximately 6,800 linear feet of the seawall. Um, again, these are the worst areas. Based on the studies of the seawall that have been ongoing since 1994, a number of alternatives were considered but were dismissed in the EA based on the screening criteria that we developed for the project. So there was a broader range of options looked at before we settled on these two. The selected alternative fully satisfies the purpose of and the need for the project with minimal impacts to the natural and cultural resources and the human environment and visitor experience. Uh, the design and implementation will address the current safety and degradation issues while maintaining the historic integrity of the cultural landscape and the contributing resources. Uh, while this, port, this project fixes only a portion of the tidal basin, um, the work that has been completed can be applied to the rest of the seawalls as funding becomes available. We're really looking at this as a pilot project, something that will help us uh, address the seawalls throughout the rest of the park. And as I mentioned with this project, we've addressed the worst areas first. Um, Mr. Webb also mentioned the master plan, which we're very eager uh, to launch in the next few months. Uh, that will take a broader view of the tidal basin uh, it will give us a chance to evaluate ways to protect the cultural landscape while also addressing the aquatic environments and high levels of visitor use and expectation, creating a, an attractive and convenient, high quality, uh, energy efficient and sustainable manner for people to visit and for us to, to uh, protect and develop the, uh, the tidal basin. So, uh, as Mr. Webb mentioned, we do have a couple other folks with me today. I'd like to turn this over to them. Uh, to talk about some of the more, spe more specifics. Ben Fedor, uh, Chief Civil Works Branch, Baltimore District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He'll talk about the inlet and outlet gates that have gotten some attention. And Margaret Boshek, uh, Senior Coastal Engineer with Moffitt and Nickel will speak of the engineering and technical aspects of the project. So over to you, Ben. All right, now, thank you very much for inviting me to this. Uh, so again, I, I really am only here to talk just a little bit about the tidal inlet gates and the outlet gates that the Army Corps of Engineers uh, operates out there in the tidal basin. Um, so these tidal gates, you know, they're, they've often been subject to a, a variety of different questions and a variety of different issues. Their primary function is not to reduce flooding in any way. Uh, so that is possibly the most, the most confusing part for people out there. All, all that they really do is help increase the water quality along the Washington Channel. Uh, so that, that is their primary function. So the US Army Corps of Engineers is currently uh, in the process of awarding an architect engineer contract to begin the process of assessing the, uh, the inlet gates that would be on the western side of the project or southern side of the project. So these are going to be going out very soon to go to a contractor to assess the condition and start working on designs. So at present, the gates are not functional, which is obviously why we're, we're going to look at it. Um, there, there are, the other reason why I came in here really was just to help answer questions, just because often there is confusion about what the Corps of Engineers has been involved with and what we are not involved with with the project. So just with our with our limited impact on here, um, I primarily just wanted to make sure that it, if there were questions for the Corps that I could be here to help. That is all. Okay, Margaret, over to you. Uh, so again, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm Margaret Boshek. Um, I have tailored my presentation to uh, adhere to the, the comments that we were receiving um, throughout this process for the Section 106 and, and now for the NCPC. I was uh, fortunate enough to receive those comments yesterday. So um, some of my, many of my slides are uh, addressing those directly. So the first was um, the need for scientists and coastal flooding experts. And I apologize, you've probably heard from me a number of times now, uh, but 
don't actually know my background. So on the next slide, um, I am a, as I mentioned, senior coastal engineer with Moffat Nickel. I have over 20 years of national and international experience. Um, I have an ocean engineering degree from FIT, and uh, I have three masters, one from um, UPC in Barcelona, Spain, uh, NTNU in Trondheim, Norway, and most importantly for this project, TU Delft in the Netherlands, which is the eminent university for flood defenses and storm gates, um, because essentially that country is underwater, so they, they have to be. Uh, next slide. Of course, I'm, I'm not doing any of this alone. I have a large team of people behind me. However, they uh, kind of tap me to be the representative on this project. Um, Robert Sloop from Bryce uh, Corlett, an amazing uh, numerical modeler. Victoria Cruto, who did a lot of uh, background and sea level rise information. Brent Moore leads a team of coastal um, scientists and engineers over at HDR, which is our JV uh, partner on this project and many other names of people underneath them as well. So we have well over 100 years of combined experience for shoreline defenses and sea level rise um, uh, studies. So next slide. This is the biggest thing we keep hearing. <clears throat> Where will the water go? And talking about um, the flooding. So next slide. Uh, as uh, Lee mentioned in, in his uh, presentation, the walls were at one point designed to be six feet higher than mean low water. And if you go ahead and click, you can see that. That uh, resolves about three feet of freeboard above the mean high water. This meant that um, the normal tidal system would always stay below uh, the, the top of the walls. But of course, larger storm systems would um, get over the walls at uh, various times in history, and, and we've seen this. Now, a couple things have happened since the, the conception of these walls, and if you go ahead and click, there's um, an estimate of sea level rise as put out by NOAA, and this suggests that there is a, a little over 1.13 feet in 100 years of, of change. Now, it has been more than 100 years since the um, construction of these sea walls, so if you go ahead and click, uh, we see that there's about 1.6 feet in 139 years of sea level rise. Now, this uh, is compounded by the fact that all these walls were placed on dredged material, which is rather soft. So if you go ahead and click, you can see that there's a settlement. Now, this is a differential sediment based on um, how deep the bedrock is beneath this soft settlement. So in some areas, this is only settled two feet, but in other areas, it's seven or even nine feet, uh, which has resulted in multiple manipulations and modifications to the walls over the years. Um, but in some of the worst areas that, that haven't been uh, maintained, such as that next to the uh, Jefferson Memorial, we see that daily inundation of just the mean high water. Uh, so this happens twice a day. <clears throat> next slide. Now, thank you, Ben, for, for setting me up, uh, talking about the tidal basin flushing, which this is an important aspect of the tidal basin. Now, if you go ahead and click, you can see that water actually enters into the inlet gate. Those gates uh, open up and allow water to enter in this one direction into the tidal basin, which creates some flushing and some movement. If you go ahead and click again, it's going to come out the outlet gate. Um, that these are one directional flow uh, gates. Uh, they, they might not be 100% efficient at this time, which is why Army Corps of Engineers is, is going in and taking a look at them to repair them. But this is the general idea of how water flows through the tidal basin. And if you go ahead and click again, we see that water flushing through the Washington Channel, which at one point in time was not only for uh, clarity, but also to push additional sediments out since this was a transportation corridor. Next slide. Now, as part of this uh, project, we did install a, a water level gauge inside the tidal basin. In fact, we've installed two. One is inside the inlet gate itself, and the second is attached near the paddle boat station there. Uh, on, um, in that image on the right toward the bottom, you see that blue uh, location marker. That is in um, a... Uh, uh, NOAA uh, tide gauge station that is maintained. If you go ahead and click, you can see a typical tidal variation uh, that happened just this past month in May. And now if you click again, you can see the water level variation inside the tidal basin as recorded by our water level gauges. 
they show that there is a little bit um, less water level inside the tidal basin, and this is just because of its inability to fill uh, uh, as quickly as, as the water levels on the outside. But what I do want to point out is the main part of this is that the water level in the Potomac River and the water level within the tidal basin are very close. They're very similar. The tidal basin never gets higher than the Potomac River. So whatever the, the water levels are in the Potomac River as coming up or downstream, it's going to, to uh, mimic what we see, therefore, in the, in the tidal basin. <clears throat> Next slide. So this is looking at uh, current flooding conditions. Now the picture in the background on here are elevations uh, throughout the, the tidal basin and um, the surrounding areas. Now I've selected this picture here just as a blow up so you can see some of those numbers. Uh, now at a daily interval, our high uh, mean higher high water elevation is 1.77. Now in this picture, it doesn't actually come over the, the walls because the walls are a little bit higher. You can see them around 1.8 toward the bottom of that graphic. And then up around the, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you see 2.2 uh, .2 or 2.4. Uh, so on a normal daily event, you wouldn't see this. However, when we have larger events that are above the mean higher high water level, such as the one month interval of 3.3, that does extend inward and and um, and water then rushes over, not rushes, but is overtopped onto the, the walkways and can actually extend all the way back and start raising up on the, the grade behind. Now the yellow would be your six month interval. This is a return period. So it's a statistical probability that would be at four feet. And then your five year return period is up at 5.2. You can see that water is creeping up that hill, um, but doesn't actually over top uh, and, and head into the memorial. It just covers the, the walkways directly adjacent to the tidal basin. So if we click again, we see um, an excerpt from the drawing set that was provided uh, as part of the, the design build package. Now this includes the rehabilitated wall at a higher elevation of 4.75, and then the slope down and the natural marriage into um, the, the walkway that is existing at the base of, of the walkway that then takes you up to um, the FDR Memorial as well. And you can see those, those contours um, showing that, that slope. If we click again, we want to point out that this picture is only that small portion of uh, the picture on the left. So we're going to look at the, the colors and the inundation um, now applied to this uh, rehabilitated wall on the right. So if we click again, we see that the mean higher high water elevation does not cross the wall. It doesn't now uh, within this area, and it will continue not to. At 3.3, because we have, and if you click again, because we have only rehabilitated the southern side of this wall and have stopped at that juncture, we will still see water coming over the top of the walkways um, in front of the FDR Memorial. And if we click two more times, we can see uh, the four feet elevation and then the 5.2. Now, the reason the 5.2 is shown over our rehabilitated wall is because our wall is at 4.75. As mentioned multiple times, this is not a flood prevention. This is heightening that wall and making it more resilient in the future to long-term effects of overtopping. Um, so the 5.2 is above uh, the rehabilitated wall, but it has a five-year return period. So if one storm comes, we have the ability to um, drain that water, quickly clean up, and get those visitors back onto the walkways. Next slide. Now, another uh, comment that we've heard multiple times is, where is this water going to go that we are now preventing from coming onto the walkways? So I'm going to hark back to my lecture years um, at university and talk about the redistribution of where those flood floodwaters would go. So as an example, if we think about two cups and that have the same volume of water, if there is a narrower cup, which has less surface area, we expect to see that water higher within the cup than the cup on the left, which has a larger um, surface area because it is wider. It has a, a larger radius. So essentially, the volume is the length times the width times the height. So going to our next uh, slide, 
and working through a calculation, I hope you can all keep with me, we are going to ignore the fact that the tidal basin is not a closed system. As I mentioned, it is open to the Potomac River and the Washington Channel and will not exceed the height of the water levels in either of those locations. But if we ignore that and pretend that this is a closed system, then we can go ahead and click and we're going to choose a, a, a very large amount of water. And let's uh, um, imagine that there's four feet of water on top of the walkway, the entire 2000 linear feet of the wall to be rehabilitated. So now this four feet of water needs to be pushed off and put back into the tidal basin itself. So if we click again, we're going to pick a round number. We're gonna assume that the walkway is 10 feet wide, even though it's not, it's more along the, the, the terms of eight, but let's take that because it, it helps us with a round number and click again. We see this calculation of the four feet of water, the full length of the 2000 linear feet at 10 feet width uh, results in 80,000 cubic feet of flood water that would need to be pulled off of that walkway and pushed back into the tidal basin itself. Well, just that length times width times height, what we wanna look at is the surface area of the tidal basin itself. So if we click again, we can easily measure this. It's about 4.7 million square feet. So now to figure out the additional height that would be added to the tidal basin from this 80,000 cubic feet of water being pushed back into the tidal basin, you can click again. It's a simple uh, division, and we see that it is only 0 0.2 inches. Now, I took a, an example of four feet of flood water sitting on top of those walkways and pushing that back off, but the reality is it's actually a lot less. Um, a picture of, of a typical overtopping at about 2.6 elevation in front of the FDR Memorial is shown on the top right, and we're only talking about moving that water back into uh, the tidal basin. So that's where the water would go. And because it is not a closed system, it just means it's not coming into the tidal basin um, from the Potomac River. So next slide. Need an assessment of sea level rise. So we'll, we'll, we'll talk about this real quick. Next slide. Um, sea level rise has been performed by NOAA uh, and is in tides and currents. And in fact, the station in the Washington Channel has its own analysis of sea level rise, which I have um, copied here. We can see those return period events based on the 2018 measurements. Now, the last epoch that uh, establishes our datums is a bit old. We are expecting a new one to come out at any time. Uh, that was from 1983 to 2001. So they looked at sea level rise again in 2018 um, because it has accelerated uh, a bit since that time. Um, and we see in NAVD, which is our, our um, the, the datum that we are using for our project, that a 100-year return period has an elevation of, of 12. Um, that is a very large flood event. A 10-year is at 6.15 two year 4.12 and one year is 3.17. We uh, decided to do our own analysis as coastal engineers. And if we click again, we uh, performed two analyses that looked at sea level rise, but also surge events and also high precipitation events within the greater watershed and how that would elevate the Potomac River. Those findings are in these two uh, documents, which is the Climate Change and Natural Hazards document and the Coastal Modeling Report. And a few excerpts from those reports are in my, my next slides. So next slide is our... Um, is our uh, numerical modeling report. This is, uh, we looked at the, the full Potomac River going all the way all the way down almost to the ocean and how those surge and tidal events would um, get pushed up the Potomac and to our project site. And if we click again, we can see the bathymetry of the site and also the stations, the federal stations, the USGS and the NOAA stations uh, that were used to calibrate these models to, to uh, ensure that they are um, replicating uh, real world events. And uh, we looked at multiple storm events um, to, to calibrate those models. Um, so from those models, we were able to develop a new uh, sea level rise estimate uh, going forward. And if we click again, 
We did look at the, the current, which uh, at the time was 2022, uh, return period events for sea level, uh, or I should say water levels within the Potomac River. But we also looked um, based on a variety of projections of sea level rise, um, scenarios for uh, 2052, 2072, and 2122. This helped us establish what our risk was not only now, but in the future for the selection of the, the seawall height. Now, there are other uh, projections from IPCC uh, within those reports as well. This one is um, a, a moderate um, addition of sea level rise. So uh, this is just one of, of I think, six uh, different uh, tables that are in there that can be reviewed. So moving to the next slide, <clears throat> we looked at common flood events today. Uh, now, common meant that they, they occurred more than 15 hours uh, per year. Uh, of water levels above that elevation. And then there were the rare storm events that is less than 15 hours per year. And you can see that in the green box. We then added on our sea level rise uh, and took us to a forecasted 2050 to 2077. And we looked at again, our common events and our future rare storm events. Now, if we click, we can see where the 4.75 within the tidal basin falls on that map. This is not to say um, that, again, 4.75 will prevent overtopping. In fact, it will not, uh, but it will prevent overtopping and degradation uh, to the backlands in most um, flood events, in the more common flood events. In the more rare events where it does overtop, uh, that water is on top of those walkways for a very short amount of time when looking at an annual uh, time frame. Um, next slide. And just to drive that home a little bit more, the seawalls were designed for resilience, not prevention. This is just the past nine years of, uh, of water levels. And what we looked at was hours above a certain threshold. And if we go ahead and click, we can see that there were a few times that the 4.75 was exceeded. In fact, um, the most recently, it was in 2021. Uh, when I made this graphic, I didn't have 2022. I'm sure it exceeded that as well, because we did have some rather large events. Uh, but for four hours, it was above 4.75 in 2021. This will become more common in the future as sea level rise continues, um, but we are removing that element of settlement. Uh, so we're only combating sea level rise at this point. Next slide. Um, also, as Lee mentioned, this is uh, the, the, the cross section that we have come up with and the design that we have come up with allows for adaptation in the future. Um, we, we see that as the sea level rises, we can add uh, future additions on top of this seawall. If you go ahead and click, those could be further removed, uh, such as additional storm defenses or a seat wall or more in line with um, preserving the existing cultural fabric. If you go ahead and click again, that could be actually adding height to those seawalls and remarrying that grade back into um, the existing um, elevations and grade of the backland. If we click again, uh, so here's another thing that we heard, the tidal basin inlet gates can alleviate flooding. And uh, thank you for, for commenting that they are not flood prevention. And I just have a few um, slides on this. If we go to the next slide, um, as mentioned, the inlet gates were built around 1908. So they do include three sets of uh, gates inside of them. Um, however, there is little to no evidence they have ever been used for flood prevention measures or are capable of of, of doing such. In fact, here are three um, pictures of the tidal basin during large storm events. The first two um, were, were more toward the peak of that event, uh, and those are over plus nine. Um, that is not something that the, the inlet gate could actually uh, prevent water from coming into uh, the tidal basin at that time. In fact, if we click again, 
going back to what I scared you with earlier with that 1% chance of uh, plus 12, here we see it. Um, this is the, the FEMA flood map for the area and the base flood elevation, which actually increases the higher you get up um, the Potomac River. So we see that plus 11, plus 12, plus 13, and the amount of inundation of the tidal basin and the Potomac parks in such a scenario. Um, there, uh, either than other than poldering off the entire parks and creating a very large mound that would um, completely um, alleviate, uh, remove your experience from from the water's edge. Um, there's really no way of preventing these uh, elevations of flood water coming in. All we can do is um, be resilient and have uh, spaces that can easily. Um, get back to their performance uh, shortly after such an event. Uh, next slide. Now, even though uh, I mentioned those, those flood elevations are very high and that entire area is flooded, now if we were, say, to uh, somehow uh, renovate those inlet gates so that they were um, flood prevention devices, any time the water elevation were to get above plus nine, which again is a very large event, it would actually bypass those gates. There are the land of the um, East and West Potomac parks uh, is low enough that anything above plus nine will actually uh, travel over land and into the tidal basin. And I would argue this would actually cause more damage um, as that water quickly flushed over that edge and, and tore apart the, the backsides of the, the land. Uh, which is something we would want to prevent. Next slide. Now, there, um, the comment has come up that this is a potential risk to adjacent memorials. So we're going to talk about the risks a little bit. If we go to the next slide, we're going to focus in on the FDR memorial and also the Martin Luther King memorial. If we go ahead and click, we can see that there is a higher elevation of about plus eight that wraps itself around the Franklin Delano Roosevelt um, uh, Memorial. And if we click again, we see um, that plus six is around the Martin Luther King Memorial. Now, if water elevations were to exceed uh, the plus eight and the plus six, then they would encroach upon these these icons. Those are pretty serious uh, storm events. Now, plus six being the lower of the two elevations is closer to about a 10 year event, um, but the, the uh, icon itself would remain undamaged. Um, now, looking at the Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, if we go ahead and click, we see that we actually step down into this icon um, and step down into one of the rooms to experience it. So these elevations are actually lower. Uh, now, a picture was provided to us on the next slide of standing water within the memorial itself. Now, this picture was taken on March 25th, and looking back at the weather the day before on the 24th, there was a large day of um, precipitation and rain uh, without a lot of heat or, or sun to evaporate that um, by the 21st. So because of the depression within and the stepping down within uh, the Franklin Delano Roosevelt, I would argue that this is a storm water um, problem within the, the memorial itself and, and not related to the water levels uh, within the tidal basin. And uh, that should be looked at separately. Next slide. So in areas where the project is showing that the wall itself will be lifted to the 4.75 or 5.5 uh, within the Potomac River and the West Potomac Park, we are looking at marrying grade uh, through a slope, which will promote gravity runoff and have positive drainage. So any rain or precipitation that lands um, upland is going to travel over and um, deposit itself back into that water body of either the Potomac River or um, the tidal basin. If we click, we can see a quick animation of this, of the water level rising, hitting, hitting the upland and quickly then draining off as that water level comes back down. It is um, our intent that no water should pond within the areas of the rehabilitated uh, seawall project. Next slide. Um, there was an assertion that no alternative plans were presented. Uh, 
uh, if we go on to the next slide, we have our design directives for the rehabilitation of this project. And those consisted of these six main points, which were to elevate the seawalls, to reestablish the historical um, functional height. We wanted to maintain the historic alignment so we're not pushing in or pulling back from the whole uh, historical alignment um, and therefore not changing the floodplain. We want to prevent the future settlement. We, we talked about um, the micropiles or foundations extending all the way to bedrock uh, to prevent any future settlement. The, we want to minimize erosion and safety hazard, rehabilitate the cultural landscapes, which included maintaining the look of the Asher um, stone wall, uh, as that is part of the, the history and fabric of this space. And we want to improve the visitor experience and keep it as dry as possible, uh, and therefore have that, that positive um, runoff and, and grading. Uh, so if we go to the next slide, there were some prior analyses done uh, on this site. The deferred maintenance has been um, many years now. And one uh, of the reports that we did review had a number of alternatives, including living shorelines or um, riprap or revetments, complete removal of the existing walls as they are, um, but still maintaining some type of of elevation change uh, for flood prevention. And we, we took these seven alternatives on the next slide and apply those to the design directives uh, that we had. And we're able to dismiss or eliminate a number of these alternatives as they did not fulfill the main design directives uh, for rehabilitation of these walls. And that is how we came to rehabilitating or heightening the wall um, uh, in its current location. Next slide. Um, it also has been commented on that there are a, are a removal of wetlands from the area. Now, wetlands do defend against flooding. Uh, I think no one would, would argue that. Um, on mass, uh, wetlands are, are very important um, for flood prevention measures um, throughout our country. Uh, next slide, I wanna introduce you to our wetlands uh, within, within the site. These are our four wetlands. Um, they are incidental wetlands and they have only uh, formed in its space because of the, um, the height of the wall, allowing water to, to pass over the wall, uh, inundating this area. Uh, which has promoted the growth of some vegetation, which would be considered wetland um, vegetation in those areas. They are not naturally occurring. Uh, they are incidental and um, constitute uh, under an acre of land. I, I don't have the exact figure, but it's very, very small. Uh, so I wanted to let you know what those, those look like, and, and those areas will just become part of the upland once those, those um, seawalls are rehabilitated. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Great, thank you. Um, and those conclude our, our comments. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I wanna thank uh, all of the presenters for that thorough uh, presentation. Um, I happen to like these kinds of presentations about water, so it was a great, it was a great classroom. Thank you. Um, um, now, um, Mr. Webb, Superintendent Reinbold, and Ms. Boschek, um, we're going to ask if any commissioners have questions for you regarding your report. So this is now an opportunity. Commissioners, if you have any questions for our, our uh, speakers on this subject, can you please identify yourselves? Mr. Dixon. Yes, sir, Commissioner Dixon. Uh, I wanted to ask the young lady, first of all, I'm uh, very, gotta be, we all have to be impressed with her credentials and her uh, depth of information. Some would say TMI, too much information. I would say so much information. And this is a global issue. I mean, this is happening all over the world. Water movement is gonna be a critical problem for all of us in time with the iceberg melting and all the concerns. Uh, and, but so I appreciate what she's presented. It's very interesting. Lastly, though, more, I want to find out whether or not the uh, level of water, water level will also similarly affect the Anacostia River, uh, because I'm assuming it is going to be affected by this water. 
That is correct. Yes, the Anacostia and the Potomac are connected and the tidal elevation changes and surges that are coming up um, yeah. are will head into the Anacostia River as well. Okay, and I hope that something, some, some attention probably will be given. We got some big plans for the, uh, the Anacostia River, east side of the river, and I'm hoping that there will be some some of your brain power and comps, your talent will be applied to it, I hope. So we can t take care of that area too. Thank you for your, what you presented. Thank you very much. Well, if you need any information, we have the model already set up and we can definitely help <laughs> with water levels throughout the Anacostia. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners? If so, please unmute or raise your hand. Okay, hearing no um, additional questions from commissioners, we are um, pl um, pleased to have seven people here today who have signed up to speak and their testimony is available on the NCPC website and it's also been distributed to the commission. First, I'd like to welcome uh, Senator Tom Harkin to provide remarks and I also just wanna note that he is a longtime friend and it's great to see you, Tom, and I look forward to maybe visiting with you this summer if you're in the area. So um, I know today you're here to speak about something you care about deeply and we welcome your remarks, Senator Harkin. Thank you very much, uh, Chairwoman Goodman. And it's nice to see you. And I can uh, tell all the other commissioners that, uh, that uh, what you have done for Dubuque in the last 30, almost 40 years, uh, really does uh, sit well for you being chair of this National Capital Planning Commission. You have transformed Dubuque into a fantastic city uh, and, and also preserving its historical uh, uh, background. So I can't think of anyone more suited to be chair of this commission than, than you. So congratulations on assuming this position. Thank you, um, Senator. Thank you for being a part of that success. Well, and I wanna thank all the commissioners here. I don't know you personally, uh, through my 40 years in Congress, 30 in the Senate, uh, 10 in the House. Uh, periodically, times would be when we would intersect with the National Capital Planning Commission. So I just first of all want to thank all of you for your dedicated public service uh, in being on this commission, in uh, making and keeping uh, our national capital area a place of welcoming of information and beauty for not only the people that work and live here, uh, but for the visitors who come from around the globe. And thank you for your dedication in making sure we preserve it for future generations. Uh, I can say from my time in Washington, uh, yours is not an easy task. So I thank you for your, for your dedication. Uh, I, just, uh, I just submit my testimony as it was written. I just wanna say that uh, 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 I'm a member of the advisory board for the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. And I have been involved with many things dealing with uh, President Roosevelt over the last 30, 30 some years. Uh, Mary Dolan is our executive director. You will be hearing from her later. And she's much more qualified to speak on this than I am. Uh, I wanna at the outset just say I'm not an authority. Uh, I'm not an engineer. Although I did start out my life to be a civil engineer, but not a coastal engineer. Uh, and uh, so I'm not an authority on this at all. But I will say that over the last several years, uh, being on this advisory board, uh, that I and others uh, have been quite upset about the lack of attention uh, paid to maintaining and keeping up the FDR Memorial. Many times I've gone there with friends or people I'm showing around. Uh, I still live in the capital area. Um, and uh, trash is around. It's not been picked up. Um, that's not true when I go to the Lincoln Memorial or the Jefferson Memorial at all. But it seems that uh, it just has not been kept up. And I might also say that many times the pumps aren't working and the fountains aren't working. Uh, Mary Dolan can speak to this, but just last week uh, before Memorial Day, uh, she was there and took, a, took some pictures of one of the 
rooms that has the walls in it, the pumps are not working. So the place is dry and kids are climbing all over these rocks, which is dangerous. So right before a very busy visitor weekend, the FDR Memorial isn't even receptive. And the same was true at cherry blossom time. Cherry blossom time, the pumps weren't working then either. So it's sort of, this has happened time and time again over the last several years. So we've been quite upset with the National Park Service about that. Now, again, I said, I'm not an authority. Uh, our board took the proposal from the uh, National Park Service. We had a couple of scientists both not working together, but singularly, uh, who disagreed with their findings and uh, said that it would cause even more flooding of the FDR Memorial. I think one of those uh, is testifying later. I I'm not personally acquainted uh, with this person, but I noted that Mr. Reinbold said, and I wrote this quote down, the project does not directly affect the FDR or MLK memorials. Well, I don't know about that. Uh, there's a direct effect and then there's indirect effect. Sometimes indirect effects can be just as, uh, just as bad as direct effects. So again, uh, we need to take that into account. I think what I really wanna say is this, we need to open up this process. This came down a year ago, but there's been really no open dialogue. There have been comment periods, of course. Um, and I know from my time of chairing committees in the Senate, you can get all kinds of written comments and things in, but nothing beats having two or three or four parties to uh, some project that is not clear cut to meet an open dialogue. Uh, with the appropriate uh, experts uh, and others uh, and have a give and take in an open kind of dialogue. And I think that's what needs to happen. This process needs to open up. It is not acceptable to us to ignore the consulting parties and not to consult openly. There's one thing to have comments. There's another thing about having dialogue and, uh, and having this give and take in an open session. I do thank the commission for making this meeting today a preliminary review. Now, again, you must understand our concern when we saw the NPS notice come out saying today was going to be a quote, preliminary and final review. Well, I'm glad now that it's just a preliminary review and not a final review. So thank you for, for making that change in the agenda for today. I guess I would just close by saying my ask is for the National Capital Planning Commission to act as the party, to, as, as the entity, to bring these parties together, bring them to the table to see what should be a proper and generally accepted proposal that meets engineering criteria. Now, this could have been done over the last year, since last July, but it wasn't uh, because the process just wasn't that opened up. So perhaps the answer to this lies somewhere in between what the two scientists on our, uh, that we had consulted and, and, and given this to and, and, and what we hear from the engineers uh, from NPS, maybe there is some, maybe, or maybe NPS is totally right. I, I don't know. I just know the process has not been open and consultative. So I'm requesting that NPC, uh, 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 get NPS and others engaged in open dialogue. And I'm asking that the final approval of this project be postponed a few months to allow for this outside vetting and consultation. Uh, how many months? I don't have a, no, I just know it can't be done in one month. This is June, it couldn't be done by July. Sometime someone suggested maybe September, but you know, in August, no one's around here in August anyway. So uh, it, it's got to be sometime a little bit later uh, and I don't think three or four months is going to cause any real problems, but it might really um, open some eyes and it might really answer some questions um, uh, that have been asked by not only our advisory board, by, but by a lot of the consulting parties that we also engage with concerning MLK and also the Japanese pagoda. So again, thank you for considering hearing and considering my testimony. 
And again, I thank you for your dedicated public service. My apologies, I was still muted. Senator, I was saying thank you for your dedicated public service as well, your many years, and we're grateful for your input today and uh, appreciate your comments. And are there any questions for Senator Harkin from uh, the commission? Hearing none. Oh yes, Commissioner Stidham. Stidham. Uh, Chair, I was just um, curious if you would like the superintendent to address uh, the items referenced by um, Mr. Harkin related to uh, the maintenance of the memorial. Um, I'm open to that at this time, unless there's an objection. And I would ask we bring uh, Jeff Reinbold back on, please. Sure, Jeff? I'd be happy to do that. Thank you. You have the floor. Um, well, thanks. Thanks uh, for sharing those concerns, Senator Harkin. Um, I will say I do take issue with the, the memorial not being or being viewed as not being cared for or cared for less. Um, over the last couple of years, we've gone through a new process to address some of the past challenges we've had there. Uh, the FDR Memorial, I would say by far, other than maybe the, um, the size of the pools for uh, the World War II Memorial, it's our most complicated memorial. Hundreds of lights, uh, seven water features, um, covers a large area. Um, it is just, it's a, it's a challenge to maintain with how complicated it is. Uh, we have brought on a contractor who picks up the litter there. They're the same folks that do the same several level of service at the other sites. It is heavily used. It's a, it's a place that uh, school groups and others love to visit. I will say we've also renovated, uh, just renovated the fountains. Uh, you are correct. We've had problems with a couple of them. Uh, those are warranty issues. Unfortunately, some of the new motors that were in were defective and the contractor is replacing those, but we hope once that is done um, that the the, found it, the uh, fountains will be good for another 20 years. So um, the care of the memorial is, is really important to us. And I think the measures we've taken now will address perhaps some past problems and definitely keep the, the water features which are central to the memorial um, uh, operating as intended. I will also say that, you know, we did reach out just for the commissioners, um, uh, that we did, um, I'm just trying to check my notes here. Um, you know, we did talk to, um, to the group uh, a number of times and their scientists, uh, asked them to share data with us, which I, best of my knowledge, we, we did not receive. Um, we've shared ours in the EA. We specifically addressed the concerns, um, very important concerns. I think by the time that, you know, we spent today, you'll see that we did take them seriously and did have uh, our scientists look at that information as well. So, um, I appreciate those comments being raised, uh, but again, I feel like when it comes to the care of the memorial and addressing the issues that have been raised, we gave that opportunity on a number of times and probably did above and beyond the process and, and again, shared the results with you and with everyone today. So, thank you. I appreciate your comments, um, Superintendent Ryan. Well, that was not reported in the prior report. So thanks for adding that, that you did reach out in the section 106 engagement period and, and engage uh, these organizations that are common citizens who work to preserve our history through these memorial uh, monuments. So uh, appreciate that input that you did include them in the discussions. And if there's further discussion going forward that you would do the same as a comprehensive plan is laid out and scheduled. So thank you. Any additional questions um, from the commission? Okay, hearing none, thank you, Senator Harkin. Next, we have Mary Dolan with the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee. Um, Ms. Dolan, you are representing an organization and you have five minutes to speak. Thank you very much. I appreciate this time. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Dolan. I'm co-founder and executive director of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, and we are a consulting party. Uh, I have submitted our April 5th public comment, which was sent to the superintendent, which included all of the data points that we had from our scientists at that time. It was sent via email, by mail, um, 
So that uh, was indeed shared. So that point needs to be very much noted. Also to be noted is that we are new at this process and learning what we need to learn as we go through this and drinking out of the fire hose. Um, we onboarded these two great scientists, one of which you're going to speak with later, um, early this year. That was after the consulting party meetings met, when we realized that we, we non-scientists, were over our head um, and um, not able to really assess this. So that's why the April comment was sent um, and included all of that, those data points, uh, including requests for further engagement and further data. So I do want to request that, um, request that that be part of the record. Um, uh, we appreciate the comments on all of these concerns, but I respectfully submit that all of this should have been done in an open exchange prior to this meeting here at NCPC as part of the 106 process. Um, the questions we have been asking since the start have not changed much, just the level of detail, again, thanks to the expertise of two scientists that we've brought on board to help us understand what we need to ask. Um, important note, Drs. O'Donnell and Valley Levinson came to the same conclusions independently. And that conclusion is that the project will not protect the area near the FDR Memorial and that it is compounded by storm surge and increase voluminous rain events, and that the use of the tidal basin inlet curtain gates could provide uh, increased protection for all the assets along the tidal basin. You also, uh, commissioners, have a signed petition by 47 people and organizations, I believe very much an undercount as we cut that off to submit for the April 5th deadline. You will see that list of signatories, individuals, and organizations, not just from the FDR committee, but from other communities and concerned citizens. I'm going to leave the science to Drs. O'Donnell and Valley Levinson, but when we were told not to worry about any risk to the FDR memorial, we asked those scientists to find the backup for that claim in the publicly available Park Service materials, and they could not. And in our April 5th comment, we asked for that data. Um, we did not hear back. Meanwhile, I can tell you what I see when I go down to the Tidal Basin. Two times recently, when I, and you have the photos, when I walked the Tidal Basin seawall, the seawall along the FDR Memorial and up well into the grassy area, almost even overtopping the first uh, step, uh, is flooded. Uh, the project, which ends at the end of the FDR Memorial, provides safety for the Jefferson Memorial and that surrounding area, but appears to put other historic assets at risk. Access to them, as well as degradation through chronic exposure to water. This not only can, includes the FDR Memorial, but the Japanese Pagoda, the Japanese Lantern, and the FDR Memorial. Section 106 process demands that adverse effects to surrounding areas must be considered. However, any impact to the FDR Memorial, which is right next to the proposed rehabilitated seawall, is disregarded. On the point of the Tidal Basin Inlet Curtain Gates, I am no engineer, but I'm just going to read to you from the Army Corps' own press release of January 20th, 2022, when it was awarded the money for looking at the Tidal Gates. It says, and I quote, the gates, designed to operate with the rise and fall of tides, prevent water from stagnating in the tidal basin by allowing fresh water to flow in and out and onto, I'm sorry, uh, stagnating in the tidal basin by allowing fresh water to flow in and out of the tidal basin. Sounds like a floodgate to me, I'm just saying. Um, also, I would just say the Historic American Engineering Record of the National Park Service, which is a document available online, also reads that the curtain gates were to be used to close the basin during floods to prevent siltage from turbid waters. Close the basin during floods. About the cultural landscape, at the January 2023 NCPC meeting, it was explained that, quote, the project will lay the structural foundation for additional wall increases in the future as needed. Well, what areas? How high? Is this rehabilitation a precedent for the rest of the tidal basin? If so, such a dramatic perspective change for the tidal basin needs to be discussed and reviewed formally. It's good to hear that a cultural landscape review is now planned, uh, hopefully, in a few years for FDR. However, that means that the Comprehensive Park Service Plan will start and likely get well underway without that report and without a hazard assessment. Five minutes. Okay. Um, 
Please look at the lack of universal design principles in the Jefferson Memorial rendering, which you saw, uh, which does not provide for environments to be usable by all people. We know that something needs to be done. It needs to be done the right way. We ask NCPC to delay approval to allow for further investigation and appreciate the time. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Ms. Dolan. Any questions for Ms. Dolan? Hearing no questions. Thank you, Ms. Dolan, for your uh, contribution. Next is Judy Scott Feldman, the National Mall Coalition. Ms. Feldman, you have five minutes to speak as well. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Scott Feldman, a, found, a founder and chair of the nonprofit National Mall Coalition, an all volunteer citizens organization formed in 2000 by DC area planners, architects, historians, and concerned citizens to advocate thoughtful, forward looking planning for our National Mall in its third century. The coalition is a consulting party to the Seawalls Project. In September of 2022, we wrote in support of the Park Service's intent to repair and rehabilitate the seawalls. But we also raised serious concerns then, and again in April of this year, about major potential adverse effects that are being ignored or dismissed out of hand. In particular, the potential for the repaired and raised seawalls to cause or exacerbate flooding in the tidal basin, at the FDR and MLK memorials, and along the Pot uh, Potomac shoreline. I hope you've been able to read our comments on the environmental assessment, which we submitted in advance of today's meeting. Now I will briefly summarize three main concerns. The Park Service has initiated what it says is compliance with Section 106 of the Historic Preservation Act with respect to this project, but the public scoping has not included open dialogue of our concerns. The environmental assessment, which is designed to address questions raised by consulting parties, dismisses any concern out of hand. First, the Park Service states that the seawall plan does not put, up, put any other area of the tidal basin at risk. What's the scientific data to support that claim? As you heard in testimony from Mary Dolan, independent scientists have concerns that the seawall project could, however unintentionally, make flooding worse elsewhere. Second, the Park Service considered no meaningful alternatives to their seawall plan. What is the scientific and historic preservation justification for using a 19th century seawall solution as the only way to confront modern scientific projections of more frequent and more intense floods in coming years. Third, how does this project work in co co coordination or otherwise have potential effects on other flood mitigation plans or proposals for the National Mall and other parts of our city? Please provide data. The coalition believes it is premature to give preliminary approval at this time especially after Ms. Boshek's testimony. We agree with other consulting parties that to answer any of our unknowns, we need more data. But we need to see that data, not during NCPC review when no give and take with Park Service experts is possible, but as part of the public section 106 process. It's obvious Ms. Boshek has limited her thinking to adhere to the Park Service design directives. Hearing only her opinion, however, is not consistent with section 106 regulations. Now let me shift my focus. In the end, even an open and public conversation about the potential effects of repairing the seawall won't get to the bigger picture. We simply lack a comprehensive forward-looking flood plan that addresses the multifaceted flood threats to the mall and city, a plan to provide guidance for individual projects like the seawalls. The coalition urges this planning commission to lead the effort to create a holistic flood plan in collaboration with the Army Corps of Engineers, as well as experts in the public realm. The American public expects as much from our nation's capital. NCPC is well positioned to take the lead. In recent years, NCPC staff have done an admirable job to educate the public about Washington's three flood risks, Potomac River, coastal or tidal, and stormwater. As staff have shown, each flood threat in itself poses huge risks to our historical and cultural resources. But what if all three happened at the same time? Imagine, for example, heavy rains flooding Constitution Avenue as they did in 2006 to devastating effect. Now add Potom Potomac River overflow. Worse, imagine this all happens during storm surge. The coalition also invites this commission to think even bigger. 
perhaps with 250th anniversary of our country in mind. As a planning task force tackles flooding, can it also look at other mall needs, including the need for new locations on the mall for the inevitable future museums and monuments? The National Mall Coalition has for many years proposed a third century mall, a plan to expand the mall boundaries onto underutilized public land in East Potomac Park and elsewhere to provide space to grow. The Macmillan Commission of 1901-2, which expanded the mall to include the Lincoln Memorial and designed the majestic mall we know today, can be one model. In conclusion, the coalition believes this project can be the impetus for bold, visionary thinking and a gift to future generations. NCPC can bring together the best minds in engineering, architecture, and science to create a comprehensive flood plan and then use that thinking to envision a resilient future for the entire mall that allows this cherished landscape to continue to thrive in its role as the stage for American democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Feldman. Are there any questions from commissioners uh, for Ms. Feldman? Any questions? Hearing none, thank you, Ms. Feldman. Uh, we have next Chris Wilson with the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. Mr. Wilson. Hey, um, you have so you have all comments that I sent to the Federal Preservation Officer, Lee Webb. Um, I just wanna add a little perspective. So I'm not an advocate. I work for the independent agency of the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation. We were formed in 1966. Uh, we're an independent agency. We have a chair, Sarah Bronin, who's appointed by the president, confirmed by the Senate. So what I have to offer today is an independent perspective about the 106 process. So the Advisory Council oversees uh, the National Historic Preservation Act, specifically the Section 106 process. Um, we, uh, I review uh, the Park Service and 13 other agencies nationwide. We have a very specific way that we uh, participate um, in, our, in our regulations where we look at several factors. So this is a case that we wanted to participate in and be a signatory. So we are a signatory on this MOA for the Tidal Basin Project. Um, so I came in very early and was part of the entire process from the beginning till the end. Um, the public involvement process was uh, wide open. There were many, many, many stakeholders. Um, everyone had an opportunity to participate. The minimization uh, process was pretty extensive. So in section 106, we look at three things in order. We look at avoidance of impacts, adverse effects. We look at minimization and mitigation. So the minimization in the document, which I'm not gonna go back and read to you, is pretty extensive. And there are several ways in which um, throughout the process of implementing the MOA that the Park Service can stop and look at unanticipated discoveries. They can even amend the document if they choose to. So again, I'm not an advocate uh, for the project. Um, I work for the advisory council, which is an independent agency. We always sign the document last after the other signatories have signed. So in this case, we have the, the Park Service, NCPC, and the DC Historic Preservation Office that signs it. It then is sent to the ACHP for us to review. We do another analysis, even though we've participated the whole time, and our analysis and review of this was that it met um, the requirement for Section 106. It was recommended for signature. Our executive director, Reed Nelson, signed the document. So the 106 process for this case has ended because it's now fully executed. Uh, I won't comment on NEPA and I won't comment on the NCPC process. Very unusual for us to be at one of these meetings. Thank you, Chair Goodman, for allowing me to speak. And look, I'm under the five minutes. I'm giving you. I'm giving you time back, as Senator Harkin used to say. I'm giving my time back. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Appreciate your comments. Are there any questions? Um, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Are there any questions for Mr. Wilson? Any questions? Hearing none. 
We'll move on to uh, Shelley Rep with the Committee of 100. Mr. Rep, you have five minutes to speak. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Shelley Rep. I am chair of the Committee of 100 on the Federal City. My testimony regards the National Park Service's intention to seek approval of a of preliminary development plans for the Tidal Basin Seawall Project from the National Capital Planning Commission. Periodic flooding in the vicinity of the cap of the Tidal Basin is a topic of national significance for which a solution must be found. Due to climate change, current flooding, which is already um, uh, which is al already affects the, uh, the MLK Memorial, the FDR Memorial, and public lands around the Tidal Basin and the National Mall is likely to get worse. The Committee of 100, by letter, letter to the National Park Service dated March 29th, 2023, has commented on the environmental assessment and Section 106 process for the rehabilitation of, of, the, of the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park seawalls and Memorandum of Understanding, offering our support for the preferred alternative. Since then, our friends at the National Mall Coalition and FDR Memorial Le Legacy Committee, who you've heard from before me, have raised concerns and questions about the project based on the advice of scientists. Since the need for the project is immediate, and given that project funding is available pursuant to the Great American Outdoors Act, we suggest that the project move forward as planned and that the National Park Service address the questions raised by uh, at today's hearing as part of the scope of work if they cannot be addressed uh, prior to final approval. We would hope that, and as suggested by Senator Harkin, that a group of scientists sitting down together with true back and forth discussion can, can get to the bottom of this issue in the very near future. Uh, there needs to be more than just, you know, like formal comment and response. Uh, which may have been the case up till now. If the concerns raised by Ms. Dolan and Ms. Feldman cannot be found, uh, are found to be real, alternatives uh, can, be, can then be pursued. Also, either as part of this project or separately, we strongly recommend reconstituting, restoring the historic floodgates at the mouth of the tidal basin so that they can be brought into play when high water is predicted, much as the barriers are raised at Washington Harbor in Georgetown. Finally, we recommend that the NCPC take, tackle a bigger but related issue. We do not wanna see the problem solved for this stretch of the Potomac only to leave unaddressed problems elsewhere in the Tidal Basin and above and below the Memorial and 14th Street Bridges. I was pleased to hear both um, Mr. Webb and Mr asked to say that plans uh, will be moving forward in the next uh, couple of months uh, to come up with a, uh, a an assessment of what is needed uh, for a, title, a, a whole title basin plan. Beyond that, and as Mr. Uh, Dixon recommends, we support a whole holistic assessment by the Army Corps of Engineers partnered with NCPC in the DC of the DC shore of the Potomac and Anacostia from Chain Bridge to Kenilworth to Blue Plains. We need a single assessment and solution. Only the Army Corps of Engineers can do this. The NP, NC, NCPC can make this happen. With planned development on the waterfronts and at the juncture of the two rivers, flooding will continue to, to, to worsen. And given that the overwhelming majority of the shoreline shorelines are owned and managed by the federal government, mostly the National Park Service, NCPC should lead the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rep. I appreciate your comments. Uh, are there any questions from commissioners for Mr. Rep? Any questions? Hearing none, our next speaker is Mr. O'Donnell. Um, you have three minutes to speak, um, Mr. O'Donnell. You can, yeah, thank you. Thanks for letting me speak this morning. Uh, I can't get through my prepared remarks in a few minutes. I've been allowed, so I'm going to skip the summary of my professional credentials. And they're in the submission I offered. Uh, but I think I'm a, regarded as an expert in coastal ocean dynamics and I'm experienced in adaptation and resilience planning. Uh, I do want to note that I'm acting as a consultant today and not in my capacity as professor of the University of Connecticut. 
And I'd like to note that some of my earlier comments have been partially aggressed today by, by projected uh, participants. And I regret I don't have time to comment on them further. What I do want to say is two things. First one is, I think the plan has missed the main threat to the parks and monuments surrounding the tidal basin. And that is the increased frequency of flooding arising from sea level rise. An important work lesson from my work in Connecticut is that by 2050, we should expect up to 20, 20 inches or 50 centimeters in sea level rise uh, above the 1983-2001 mean. And it's prudent that any new coastal project bear that in mind. Now, that's the approximate upper bound of what's likely. And there's obviously lots of ways of projecting the future and they differ, but this estimate is roughly consistent with them all. Further, projections for sea level rise by 2100 show that it's very unlikely to be less than 50 centimeters. Uh, so the practical consequence of this is the expected frequency with which the park and the access to the monuments should be expected to be flooded will increase substantially. My colleague, Dr. Vaya Levinson, and I made some preliminary estimates uh, of what would happen if the conditions that led to the March 2023 flooding were to occur with just an additional one foot of sea level rise, which is the most likely estimate. The graphics in his submission show that the FDR memorial surroundings would be flooded. Another way to think about this is that the March 2023 flooding should be expected something like every five years by 2050. These estimates should be refined by more detailed surveys and analysis and the, and the impacts of more frequent flooding on the use of the park and the, monu and the monuments by the public and the increased cost of maintenance of the infrastructure should be assessed. I understand that authors of the report may not have been instructed to look forward in their plan. However, the parks and surrounding monuments are national assets and an expensive project like project like this should not move forward without a credible assessment of the future flooding risks. The design should determine what flooding risk is tolerable in 2050 and 2100, and the design project should then be developed. I think it's obvious the most cost-effective adaptation strategy for towns and agencies is to build resilience into the routine maintenance plan for the infrastructure. Not doing so is really impu imprudent use of public funds. And I have a second point, and that is that the existing tide gates that bound the basin and, and the elevation of the seawall along the river provide an obvious mechanism with which to protect the area for the national monuments that are currently experiencing flooding. Just as the wall was not designed to prevent flooding, the gates weren't either. The redesign exercise could do that, at least for floods that have a frequent level of occurrence, like maybe one in 20 years. The, this is exactly Three the minute, Mr. O'Donnell. Okay, thank you. The Army Corps is great at this, um, and I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. O'Donnell. Thanks for joining us today and for your comments. Um, are there questions for Mr. O'Donnell from uh, any of the commissioners? Any questions? Hearing none, uh, I want to thank you very much uh, for your contributions. And next, we have Chris Cody with the National Trust for Historic preservation. Um, um, Mr. Cody, you have five minutes to provide your comments. Thank you very much. While the National Trust views this effort as just the beginning of comprehensively addressing the full set of challenges at the Tidal Basin, we were very supportive of NPS's plan for the rehabilitation of 6,800 linear feet of the seawall. Specifically, NPS will rebuild the seawall to prevent settling, increase the seawall height 4.75 feet within the tidal basin and 5.5 feet along West Potomac Park, salvage and reuse stones from the historic wall and the rehabilitated seawalls and widen walkways to provide smoother, more accessible connections. An essential element of the National Mall and beloved as America's front yard, the tidal basin is home to a remarkable collection of landmarks and legacies that span centuries of American history. Yet, as the National Park Service knows, the tidal basin is in perilous condition due to a combination of rising sea levels and sinking landfill, resulting in steady deterioration of the cultural landscape and infrastructure. Ever increasing foot traffic, wear and tear, and the effects of the changing climate on the National Mall are endangering the future sustainability of the tidal basin and severely impacting the visitor experience, especially for those people with accessibility challenges. Experts conclude that in 70 years, the Tidal Basin's cultural landscape will be under three to 12 feet of water, eliminating public access and any use of this historic place. 
So profound are the challenges to the stewardship are the challenges to the stewardship of the tidal basin that the National Trust and the Trust for the National Mall join forces beginning in 2019 to leverage public input, private sector expertise, and visionary philanthropic support to provide the NPS with bold, innovative, long-term concepts through the Tidal Basin Ideas Lab. Unlike a conventional design competition, which selects one winner, the Ideas Lab brought together five leading American landscape architecture firms, each with a distinctive proposal to promote an exchange of ideas to inform and inspire future discussions about the Tidal Basin and to get the public directly involved in shaping its future. Major themes from the Tidal Basin Ideas Lab that we encourage MPS to incorporate in all of its planning for this and future preservation projects include adopting new ecological systems, revised interpretation of memorials, flexible approach to circulation and connectivity, enhancing vid visitor enjoyment, recreation, and accessibility. Importantly, the National Trust continues to encourage MPS to actively reach out, engage, welcome, and enable the full participation of diverse stakeholders in the environmental assessment and the Section 106 process, inviting them to participate as formal consulting parties. And participating consulting parties should in turn share their data and opinions to enrich the ongoing public discourse. In conclusion, the National Trust supports NPS's plans for the rehabilitation of the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park seawalls it is an important and worthy first step towards the future multi-phase seawall repair and the anticipated comprehensive master plan, which we strongly encourage be initiated soon. In addition, we applaud NPS's plan to complete cultural landscape reports for both the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial and the FDR Memorial to address their specific needs. The seawall rehabilitation project is sorely needed to address the effects of climate change at one of our nation's most important and iconic cultural landscapes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Cody. I'd like to uh, ask again, uh, are there any questions from commissioners for Mr. Cody? Any questions? Hearing none again, thank you very much. And I'd like to um, tell all of you guest speakers and contributors how grateful we are for your input. And um, I think clearly the robust discussion today or presentation and the quality of the comments demonstrate all of our concern for the future and the impacts of climate change. Uh, I do think that um, we have um, a small approach to repairing a wall uh, here today, but I, I want to hold up the fact that there will be a comprehensive plan in the future that would be significant for everyone on this on this in this meeting to participate in as much as possible, but also to have these cultural surveys completed in a timely fashion to uh, match up with that comprehensive plan would be uh, very important too, I believe. Right now, I'd like to ask um, and open this up, ask the commission to have our discussion. And so can everyone please turn on your cameras, commissioners, and I will um, ask if there are any, um, any uh, thoughts right now or any contributions. First, I need a motion though to approve the preliminary site development plan for the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park seawall rehabilitation. Is there so moved. Madam Chair, oh, I'm sorry. I'll okay. second them. It, it's seconded then, it, um, moved. And I'm not sure who made that motion. That was me, Commissioner Wright. Thank you, Commissioner Wright. And thank you, um, Vice Chair Hewlett for the second. Um, so, um, can we begin now? I'm going to go with the round robin format. Commissioner Argo, can you please start with comments? Um, I'm, I'm happy to. I don't have any substantial comments. I think it's, um, I took all these notes. <laughs> now I have to I have to figure out what's worth sharing <laughs> with anybody else. Um, I think I, I, I want to say that I appreciate the comments heard from some of the from some of the public members that uh, signed up to um, to speak on this. Um, I had I had only one. I had a question about the timeline on the proposed project. Um, can anybody respond to that? If this project is approved, what the timeline looks like. Commissioner, for, um, yeah, for planning, um, construction, and completion. 
Commissioner Sidman had her hand up. Yes, so um, we are slated to award a design build contractor um, in the September timeframe. Uh, mm -hmm. We have the funding to move forward. Um, the design build contractor will take our designs from where they are now mm -hmm. uh, to full construction drawings and then construction will we'll start as soon as that design, design build process is through, which I think will take about a year to get through that portion of the project. Mm -hmm. Um, I will add that uh, within the MOA, there are um, additional uh, stipulations related to design review as the process moves forward. So while this portion of the 106 project process has been completed, there will be continued consultation on the design. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have any additional comments, Commissioner Argo? Uh, no, not at this time. Thank you. Okay, Commissioner, Vice Chair, Commissioner Hewlett. <laughs> Sorry, Betty. <laughs> it's okay. It, it's it's taking time to get used to it. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so th this is not easy. And we've heard it time and time again that we're really balancing interests. And we're trying to make the best decision, giving, protecting our um all, all the natural resources and the historic sites and we, we, we've heard it said that, you know, in, in our efforts, to, in the efforts to protect the historic sites, we might be doing more damage to the historic sites. And I hope that's not the case. Um, we've listened to the experts. We've read at every single one of these submissions that, um, and some people, you know, highlighted them today and some people read them verbatim today, but um, we've got that information. And I thank all the speakers for, um, for their participation today, um, commencing with Senator Harkin but all of them have been invaluable. I do want to take, but we are balancing interests. And I have to take a moment to give a shout out, a thank you shout out to Ms. Boshek because she broke it down for me. In addition to our, to our wonderful NCPC staff, in addition to everyone else who spoke today, Ms. Boshek broke it down for me and her exhibits were very, very um, illustrative. Um, because you could really see what was going on and she broke it down in a way that's um, for the, us non-engineers, we, we were able to understand it. And so um, I, I wanted to take a moment to, to um, thank her for that and to thank everyone. Um, I, I seconded the motion because I think um, we've had communication and I do thank our staff for indicating that there was communication give and take earlier pursuant to the section 106 process, because we've heard time and time again, there's been no dialogue, but I'm hearing now that there will be continued dialogue in terms of the design and whatnot. And I hope that we can continue to, to pr promote that open dialogue because a lot of questions may be answered and addressed before we get to this point or, or before we get to the next point at this time. So um, I just want to thank all the speakers, say I do support this because that is what the, the um, record and the evidence seems to uh, glean for me, that this is an important project, but it doesn't mean that we can't continue our communication. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Hewlett. And a Commissioner, Brian Green, I think you're still thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. No, um, thank all the speakers. This was a, a, a very informative. And, you know, as, as a part of the conversation, I'd like to encourage any efforts, as we've heard, to, to, towards a comprehensive solution to the problem, not segmented solutions to this problem. And to, to reiterate something Senator Harkin said, you know, indirect impacts are still impacts. And to that effect, to that end, it would be, I would like to see the Park Service agree to move up funding for the MLK and FDR cultural resource studies so that that information is available at the beginning of the comprehensive planning process, not midstream or late stream, so that those impacts can be studied and analyzed from the very beginning. And, um, and thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Green. Uh, Commissioner Wright. Well, gosh, I'm just flummoxed because I just did not expect this to become so controversial. And I'd like, there's, a, I think um, uh, Vice Chair Hewlett um, said it well when about balancing interests. So, so there's the historic preservation concerns and the natural resources concerns. Um, 
but I would like to say something that I, I find it quite distasteful to impugn the integrity of the Park Services consultant as though she's a hired done, you know, and, and gonna say whatever she needs to, to get the project through. That's not right. That's, 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 not, a, that's not the right way to approach this. Um, and because we, if you disagree with her findings, fine. But to to suggest that she's just saying whatever, you know, being wound up and told what to say is 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 just not OK. Um, and I also find it, you know, so often, you know, we sign MOAs and MOUs and all the lawyers online will, will know that they are not legally enforceable and they depend on the comedy between federal agencies. And, and there's a startling lack of it here today, again. And I think it's particularly ironic. I'm almost glad that Peter May is not representing, poor Tammy, I'm so sorry for you that this is your first meeting. Um, because it's well known that Peter and I are, are friends and go way back. But my, my support of the Park Service here is not at all based on that, but rather as somebody who has a job that's not unlike this, you know, out year funding is impossible to predict, number one. I had some questions about the incremental approach who, when we first looked at this, but they're laying quite literally the physical foundation so that this project will not waste the money that they're spending now to address immediate problems. Um, that makes sense. If we wait, you know, I've heard a lot about planning holistically, yes, but that doesn't mean you do nothing in the interim until you get to the point where you can, you know, um, solve for the whole problem. Um, I'm not an engineer either, and but I thought that Ms. Um, Bolshek, I think, sorry if I'm um, butchering your name, um, I thought the data she presented was was very compelling. Um, I'm not in the position to judge um, whether or not it's um, it's incontestable, um, but but I but I but I do think I'm in a position to judge whether the 106 process what um, was conducted with integrity. Uh, little known fact: I was appointed in, um, in 1986 as an expert member of the advisory council, so I have seen their work from the other side. <laughs> Um, as well from both sides, as as a person who brings projects through the 106 process myself um, now, and in those days was at uh, at the commission level looking at them. And so, if the advisory council takes the unusual step of showing up here today to ensure that the process had integrity, that's good enough for me. Um, and so, I th I think. We should keep in mind that that it's not only a balance of interest, but it's also a balance of chronology, um, and a balance uh, 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 some uh, uh, of money. It is very difficult for the Park Service to get the money to do it all at once, and unfortunately, it's not unlike the blinking red lights that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, about room on the mall, um, or I have spoken about in previous um, meetings. There are, yes, there are blinking red lights that we we seem to be ignoring when it comes to climate change, but but we're making good progress. And, and the fact that we don't have all the money in hand or all the data in hand to plan for the next hundred years, again, should not mean that we do nothing in the interim, that we do nothing incremental. And there are immediate problems that need to be solved at the Tidal Basin that have been very well documented and explained to us. So I would urge that we let the Park Service do its work and at the very least, trust their integrity and assume good intent. Thank you very much, Commissioner Wright. Okay, we have Commissioner Dixon. 
Uh, I, I will associate myself with a lot of the comments of my colleagues, particularly Commissioner Wright's last comments. There was some mention of trying to get some more time. Uh, I wondered what a delay would do uh, to guarantee more participation if that is missing. Uh, can I get maybe an answer to that and what the time that might be? Commissioner Sidham. Um, I would say that as, um, as far as planning, um, we have done all the planning associated with the needs of this section. We have developed a foundation that will not settle. We have developed a wall system that will keep that historic look in alignment. And we have done the data associated with making sure that none of the other assets either under our um, uh, management or management of others are being affected by this project. Um, uh, delaying the uh, approval now um, will hurt our project um, and will not allow it to go forward. I think we have shown our due diligence on all fronts um, related to this project um, and, and really ask that um, it move forward. Thank you, Commissioner Stidham. Did you have any other uh, comments, Commissioner Dixon? Yeah, I just uh, I uh, first of all, I support what was just said that they've done. Uh, certainly, I think they've done what was needed. But would one month make a difference if there is some sense that they need to have more uh, participation? Um, so I was going to address it in my comments when it came my turn. But as far as participation, I wanted to be clear about the amount of participation that we have done. You know, you know, the Park Service does a lot of projects and our intent is to hear from everyone. And we go, you know, as far as we can possibly go to reach everyone in many different ways. We had a public scoping meeting as the project started back in July of 2022, where, you know, and I know a comment period is not, um, you know, engagement, but during that public comment during the meeting itself, there was a question and answer period, an opportunity to ask questions and get more information. We also had a 55 day comment period where we took in a lot of comments and we responded to those. The two section 106 meetings that we had were open dialogue where we went through not only uh, the science, much of the science that you saw today, but also through the assessment of effects that looked at all the historic properties within the area of potential effect to ensure that the consulting parties, one, knew what historic properties were in the area and had been identified as concern and what the impacts were at that time. Um, and we were clear, we were transparent and clear about what was affected and what was not affected. We asked for, we, after that meeting, we provided the assessment of effect and a draft MOA for review by the consulting parties. We gave them 30 days to review that, to ask more questions, uh, to get more information and to provide us input before we finalized either of those documents. And then there was the public comment period during the EA. Um, we have met with the FDR Foundation um, three or four times myself, along with our scientists and other consultants, um, that in addition to these meetings that I spoke to. So we have offered ourselves up as much as we possibly could in terms of engaging and having an open process. That's the way we do things. Um, and that's the way we did this for this project. So, um, you know, we've had the dialogue. There will be continued dialogue as the design progresses um, with the master plan. Um, there will be more dialogue. It's going to be an environmental assessment with full section 106 as well. Lots of opportunity for additional conversation, dialogue, and input. And we look for that. We appreciate that. I don't see a project that isn't improved by that dialogue. So um, you know, we're, we're here to hear, and we have been here along the way to do that. Um, and, and we are still open to more conversation as the process moves forward. Commissioner Steven, I just want to recognize that um, no, it's very important that we all understand that I don't believe there has been anything but uh, good intent from all of the parties here today, and especially at your first meeting. I'm sorry, this has probably been a little grueling. You're, you're really uh, standing up to the challenge. I also want to say all of our guest speakers, too, I, I don't think we want to question their intent because we are the commission, after all, where these things come 
to eventually to to be discussed. And if there are concerns, there are lessons we can all learn. I do, I just think we all in good will need to understand that, but certainly appreciate the, the good work of the uh, Department of Interior and National Park Service on this uh, challenging um, challenging project. So thank you. Did you have additional uh, comments you want to make? Now it's out of order, but I can certainly, if there are other comments you wanted to make, uh, Commissioner Stidman, on this project? Oh, there is, there is. Uh, you know, I think this project from the get-go has there's been a bit of a confusion, at least to the public, as to the intent of the project. You know, there's there's flooding, as um, Mar uh, Ms. Bojack uh, displayed, that is widespread flooding, flooding beyond the tidal basin, flooding that would occur um, no matter what we did at the tidal basin. And in, in this pro and that is a larger effort. And in that effort, we do participate. The Park Service participates with the Yellow Jackets in looking at how to deal with widespread flooding. What we're talking about here is we're talking about a wall uh, that surrounds a tidal basin that has sunk four to six feet over time because it was basically built on fill and on rubble. So of course, after a hundred years, it's going to sink. Um, we wanted to, and, and we had to, in this project, because of the limited funds and the type of funding that we're using, we had to focus on the pieces of this wall that were most at risk. And these pieces weren't just most at risk because they were settling, but because the settling, the nuisance flooding that came about was further degrading the cultural landscape. And to do nothing here in this case was an adverse effect under Section 106. Um, and, and, and that's that's not the right move to allow something to continue to occur until we have funding to do the entire wall. It, it just, it's not practical, it's not realistic. So taking this move and repairing these portions and taking them back to their historical functional site um, in their correct alignment with, it, it, with at the end of this uh, will look like they were there always because we're reusing the stone. Um, those were the criteria we're making. Now, none of this goes wasted as we look at the rest of the wall. Uh, we didn't only investigate this portion of the wall. We investigated the entire tidal basin. And you saw some of that drawing in what Ms. Boshek displayed. We know the elevations of the wall all the way around, as well as the adjacent elevations. And as we move forward, the, the design work and the engineering that we have done will apply to those walls and bring those walls up to their, their historical function height as well. The master plan will bring all of this together and looking at our increased visitation, uh, the effects to the cultural landscape, the adjacent memorials, the adjacent other park areas. And we will, we will put back the rest of the wall um, you know, as it makes sense from what we have learned from this project and what moves forward with the comprehensive plan. Um, uh, I think that I think that's it. You know, we I just wanted and the CLRs, well, they are very important documents and they are baseline documentation that we do for all of our sites. Um, they are not essential to this next step and they were not essential to the step that we just took. Um, uh, as I think um, uh, Commissioner Wright noted, uh, I can't commit to funding something that I don't already have in my pocket. I can commit to the MLK CLR, which we already have funding for, um, but the FDR CLR, we are looking for funding and we will fund it as soon as we can. Um, but it is in line, we recognize its importance, but um, we can only work with what we have. Um, and, and I think that's it. I mean, this is a very important project um, to the Park Service, to the area, I think to the cultural landscape um, of, of the area and the importance of the tidal basin to the city. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Stidman. And I hope you come back to the next meeting. Um, uh, uh, Commissioner Cozart, uh, do you have comments? Uh, yes, very briefly. Just want to thank the staff for uh, the report and the presentation um, and to the Park Service for providing a um, excellent outline of, of, of the project that's at hand. I want to thank um, all of the um, speakers um, who gave uh, testimony uh, from the public and appreciate your passion and enthusiasm that you, you um, demonstrate in advocacy. Um, I want to align myself with uh, the comments of uh, Vice Chair Hewlett, particularly as it relates to continued engagement and this idea of balance and also align my 
um, self with the comments of Commissioner Wright about this point of literally laying the foundation for what's next and also the integrity of the 106 process. Uh, that's, that's all that I have. Thank you very much. And Commissioner McMahon. Thanks, uh, Chair. I'm gonna apologize for having to step out. Uh, I'm back. And so I will say before I, I give my couple comments that I have read in detail the report of the staff um, and the work done by NPS coming forward. Um, and have read all the uh, written comments uh, provided by the public uh, and then caught a couple of the last three speakers um, uh, as I returned. That being said, um, as uh, many other commissioners said, I will also associate myself with uh, uh, the commissioners have already spoken. Um, I, I believe the report was solid. I believe the requirement is, is definitive and I think it can be well satisfied by the plan of Park Services outline for this initial phase to continue to support our efforts to combat climate change in the national capital region. I look forward to those. And uh, Commissioner Stidham, I don't think you can bring Peter back. So we welcome you and uh, for your first one, you did well. That's my comments, ma'am, thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner McMahon. I think all the other commissioners have spoken. So I have a few comments I'd like to make as well. Again, I think robust discussion is a good thing. And I think we should always come to this table and not question people's intent. I think that um, we all get better through discussion and that's the point of any section 106 and appreciate the work that was done and also appreciate that I work in, you know, please understand, I work in a city where we're constantly confronted in a historic town on the Mississippi River with historic preservation section 106 NEPA, but also um, subsidence. And that's going to take me to this wall question. Um, you know, I think that um, I heard um, Ms. Boschek say that they were following the design directives and understanding projects that we receive and we undertake at our local government level, you follow the design directive and it, she said it was specifically related to the subsidence of what is an historic artifact, the wall itself, that it has subsided into the primordial goo that it is located in and it needs to be restored to its original height and its original resiliency as a I'm going to use this word as a band-aid measure, but also a foundational band-aid measure to look at not only the cultural landscape and the monuments that are impacted to stop, to put your finger in the dike, stop the damage as much as we can to that cultural landscape now, but also to um, potentially be used in the future as a foundation for improvements that will address um, the larger concerns we have at the mall and at, at, in the tidal basin, which is climate change. And I thought that the uh, presentation by um, Ms. Boschuk today was uh, outstanding. I appreciated it. We have lots of these on the Mississippi River as well. Um, and we also do know that there can be displacement of water when there are uh, in, when there is foundational um, change to a, a wall structure, gray infrastructure on water. So understand all the concerns. I think it's been very educational. I really appreciate the um, willingness of uh, our guests to come and speak today to share their concerns because as we go forward with a comprehensive plan, we do all need to be able to listen to one another and dig really deep because there are no answers uh, anymore. Um, there, the, the answers we're going to discover together are going to be through a lot of public input and engagement and a lot of very smart people. So I look forward to the future and the comprehensive plan. I would hope that we could move those cultural surveys up if we have to help find some money for the interior department, uh, maybe we can. And so um, that's just, you know, another option, but I, I think we, we can move forward with this wall. I support it, but I also wanna make sure that the section 106 is robust for the comprehensive plan and thank everyone for their contributions today. Um, Unless anyone has any additional comment, any commissioners? Then Ms. Coster, can you please confirm the motion in the second and call the roll? Yes, the uh, motion uh, to uh, approve the preliminary site development plans for the Tidal Basin and West Potomac Park seawall rehabilitation was made by Commissioner Wright and seconded by Vice Chair Hewlett. Um, with that, Commissioner Cozart? Yes. Commissioner McMahon? Yes. Commissioner Stidham? 
Yes. Commissioner Arco? Yes. Vice Chair Hewlett? Yes. Chair Goodman? Chair Goodman? Are you on mute? Yeah. Yes, I was. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Green? Yes. Commissioner Wright? Yes. Commissioner Dixon? Yes. Thank you. The motion has carried. And thank you, Ms. Coster. So this concludes our open session agenda. Our next regular commission meeting will be Thursday, July 6th at 1 p.m. And if there's no further business, the session is now adjourned. I want to thank everyone today for their attention and their contributions. We're adjourned. Thank, thank you. you. Thank okay. you.